We're going to start with module three and then we'll go to module two afterwards. We're going to start with group seven. Oh, so it was up. All right. So we're starting with group seven. I'm going to use first paper to just go through these topics. All right. Just let if if your friends are asking about the class link or so forth, just let them know the class is filled. So they will have to watch it on the panel. All right, so I'm going to do the 2018 class paper question six, all right, and use it to explain group seven. All right. So for once you come to module three, you must know the trends, all right? So 2018, we got a table, all right? Yep. All right, so we know that these elements, so as you go for group seven, as you go down the group, we know they change from gas to liquid to solid. So fluorine, we know is a gas. Chlorine is a gas. Bromine is a liquid. And iodine is a solid. So state at 20 degrees Celsius, that is basically the state at, 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 at room temperature. All right, so we know that going down the group, the physical properties basically increase, all right? 
in terms of colonel, chlorine is pale yellow. Chlorine is pale green. Remember to make Remember to ensure that your mics are muted. So those are the colors. No, this table, it was already filled out but they could question you on the next paper about either the state or the colors. For melting point, we know that it would increase as you go down the group. Remember physical properties, such as melting and boiling point, as you go down the group, it increases. <laughs> But you know, what I want to explain why the melting point increase as I go on the group. What is of any because density increase? All right. Well, in terms of as it goes down the group, like it's a stronger attraction as to break the bonds. Repeat that one. As it says, it's it's going to be a stronger attraction to break the bonds. I'm not hearing it clear. I hear something about attraction and bonds, but it's something to do with the bonding. So what can you so tell me? That as it descends, the group is going to need a stronger intermolecular attraction to break the bonds. Oh, it as of, as I got down the group, the intermolecular force of attraction is stronger. So it would take more energy. energy to melt or oil. So, Christian, can you tell me why, as you go down the group, the intermolecular force of attraction is getting stronger? Before you tell me why, before you tell me why it gets stronger, can you tell me the type of intermolecular force that is present? Wonderwalls. That is correct. And when it comes to Wonderwalls, the bigger the molecule and the more electrons present, the, strong, the stronger the attraction will be, right? So, that's just, so as I go down the group, the boiling point, melting point increase. Now, in terms of bond energy, bond energy, as I go down the group, it actually decreases. And anybody tell me why? Is it because the electron density of the last one decreases? Repeat that. You are kind of picking up. I would say is it because the electronegativity of the molecule decreases going down the group? But also the size of the atom. So because fluorine is smaller, the attraction between the chlorine and the hydrogen is stronger. So that bond, it would be harder to break. Right? So the smaller the, the molecule, the harder that bond is going to be to break. So iodine is a very large molecule. The attraction that exists, it will not be as strong as fluorine, which is a much smaller one. All right, so bond energy. And the next one now, the final one, is the inner value. And we will look at how this applies. So for fluorine, it was positive 2.87. Let me write that better.
positive 1.36, positive 1.07, and positive 0 0.54. And remember these data, you will get your data booklet with these inner values as well. So are they going to give us the clear or we're going to be the one to give us the clear? Good. But like the color, are they going to give us the clear or should we know that by heart? No, you should you should know the color. Sir, one sir, we, um we're going to get the melting point in the data sheet. No, but like if they want to if it's not a general trend that they want you to tell them about the melting point, but you will not need to know the exact value, the melting point, but you must know the trend. So the melting point decreases as a go down the group, right? But like color, you should remember the color as well as the states, right? But like the exact value for band energy, no. All right. All right. So that that was the table given for us, and then we have some questions to answer. So when it comes to the melting point, all right. All right. So let me answer question. It says, or let me put it on the board. This was question two, not question two, question six. Six A, they asked us to explain the trend. All right, so explain the trend in volatility of the halogens going down the group. So volatility. So if you're up, so volatility, basically, like if you know you have a bottle of alcohol and you leave it open, this scent, it will go on after a short period of time. So basically, it's, oh, easily it forms a vapor and escape. Sorry, decrease the one group. That is correct. Give me a second. Just a second. Right. So as you were someone was saying it would decrease. And that is correct. So if you look at state at 20 degrees Celsius. Chlorine is a gas, chlorine is a gas. So these would be very volatile. Now, if you put down a bottle of water and let's say a bottle of alcohol, the alcohol would evaporate quicker than the, than the water. If that happens, it means that, remember, when you boil water, you are breaking the intermolecular forces. So remember from unit one, sorry, not unit one, from Friday's class, and module one, I think I told you that when you boil these compounds, right, or heat them, you are breaking the intermolecular force. 
they are not breaking the actual covalent bond. So how easily the intermolecular force, by the way, what is the intermolecular force in water? Hydrogen bonds. Right. Hydrogen bonds. So basically, how easily it is to break your intermolecular force of attraction that determines how volatile the substance is. So if it is easy to, the intermolecular force is very weak, then that substance is going to be volatile. So chlorine and fluorine are gases, the intermolecular forces are weak. It is easily to break, not much energy needs to be applied. If it is easy to break, what does that tell us about the intermolecular force? In terms of a chain, no. That it is weak. Weak. Right. Weak. It's weak. Right. As I go down the group, it, it gets even weaker. The question going down the group. Well, going down the group, volatility is going to increase, not decrease. Right. So if I had said it would decrease, no, it will increase. So going down the group. Volatility, sorry, let me not mix up myself. <laughs> Volatility is going to decrease. Sorry, yeah. So it will decrease. Why will it decrease? What is happening as a go down the group? The number of electrons <laughs> increases. As well as something else increases. The atomic radius increases. Right. So yeah. two things happen. All right, so to answer this question, right? We first identify the, we know that it has to do with the intermolecular force of attraction. So we know that the intermolecular force, the intermolecular force of attraction is Van der Waals, all right? So since it is Van der Waals, we need to know what affects Van der Waals forces. And that would include the number of electrons and the size of the atom. So once you identify this, right, let us state the, the trend. So it says explain. So let, let us state it first. All right. So as you go down the group, the first we stayed our trend, right? Now we explain. So we know that the reason why it is going to decrease is because the strength of the intermolecular force does what? Weak. Okay. Increase as you go on. So this is because the strength You can put intermolecular force in it if you want. Oh, by the way, it's for two marks. So as you go down the group, volatility of the allergens decrease. This is because the strength of the Van der Waals forces increases. And if you want to add, I guess you could mention now this, the size of the atoms and the number of electrons increases, which is why the, which is why the strength would increase. 
Right? So we state the trend and we explain it. So the strength of the bond dollars was increased. All right. Let me just add that. As the size of the atoms and number of electrons increase. This same question here, right? Where it says, explain the trend in volatility. It could easily have said, explain the trend in melting point and boiling point. But if tomorrow you say boiling point or melting point, it's the same reason. Because boiling point, melting point, that is dealing with breaking the underworld's forces, all right? May add something here so you can understand a little more. Hold on. So there of the relationship between volatility and boiling point. Um, sir. Yes. Go ahead. So you said that um, the when we say boiling point and the melting point is the same thing for the explanation at the validity, the valid whatever. Right. Okay. Yeah, because with valid with volatility. It is looking at how easily you break the intermolecular force. And when you are boiling something, the lower the boiling point, it means the easier the intermolecular force of attraction is to break. Right. So that is why I'm pointing it out that high volatility means a low boiling point. The bond is easy to break. All right, so if tomorrow you, you should see it trend about melting or boiling point, you'll stick with the reason. All right, so part B. All right, I'll give you about 30 seconds, right? And then I'm going to share the screen. So if you need to take a screenshot, you can do so. And with this, you can put it in your own words, you know. Just remember that as you go down the group, the Van der Waals force, the strength of it, it is increasing because of the size of the atom and the number of electrons. And once it increases, it will require more energy to break, all right? So you don't have to swat any answer. Just remember as you go down the group, the strength of Van der Waals force increase because of the size of the atom and the number of electron. All right, and for that reason, boiling point is higher as you go down the group. So is the melting point. All right, I'm going to share the screen now. So if you haven't finished writing, just take a screenshot for me.
Sir, for iodine surgery, E naught of it is 0.54 or 1.54. Sir, no, you're, you're in. My, my mic was, I just realized the mic was on mute. Sorry about that. All right, right, so I was asking, before we answer this question, can you just remind us what is oxidation and reduction in terms of electrons? Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. Right. What would that, what would happen to an oxidizing agent? It will lose the electrons and its oxidation number will increase. Uh, in terms of Oxidation and reduction. Oxidizing it would be are, reduced. Right. The oxidizing agents are always reduced. Now, what these numbers are showing you is the tendency of the halogen to actually accept electron. So the more positive the number is, the better it is at accepting electrons, right? The question says, use the inner values and the sodium sulfate reagent, explain the reactiveness of halogens. So if it is able to accept electrons readily, is going to be more reactive. So the better an oxidizing agent, the more reactive it is. So again, these values are telling you how easily it accepts electrons. And if it accepts electrons, it is going to be reduced, making it an oxidizing agent. So based on that, which of these elements would be the most reactive? Fluorine. Fluorine. That is correct because it has the highest E naught value. Getting it in with sodium thiosulfate, there's a reaction with between them and the sodium thiosulfate. I will do the equation afterwards. So, answer this question, right? We need to mention that the higher the E naught value, the greater the tendency of the element to be reduced is to accept an electron. All right, so if I'm answering this, I would state the E naught. State the E naught of each element to start out with. The E naught for thiosulfate is positive 0 0.09. So what this is saying, right? Since as the E naught for thiosulfate is lower than all of these, it means that all of these will gain Electrons from thiosulfate. So the thiosulfate would be oxidized and these would be reduced. So positive 0 0.9 compared to all of this, the thiosulfate would have a greater tendency to give up electrons compared to these. Could you please repeat? All right. So we are using the E naught values here and the and sodium thiosulfate explain the reactiveness. 
I'm saying that even though we don't know the, the redox equilibrium yet, the more positive these numbers are, the better they are at giving up electrons. So when I did electrochemistry, which is redox equilibria, you would realize like reactive metals such as zinc, they have a negative E naught value, meaning they tend to give up electrons rather than accept it. So all of these will accept electrons from pure sulfate because it has a lower E naught, but fluorine will do it the best because it has the highest E naught. Someone raise their hands, you can go ahead. Yes, sir. I was just asking me to repeat what you said the value is again. You said that it is the value to that shows um oh. their tendency to basically it is showing their tendency to gain an electron. Okay, sir. Yeah. All right. So did they give the value for um, pairs of things? Yes, they give it in the question. My ear is for iodine. All right, let me just write it out.
for chlorine, I mean for fluorine, where we have most reactive, we can put the strongest oxidizing agent. It is the most reactive of the allergens and the strongest oxidizing agent as well. So fluorine is the most reactive and the strongest because it has the highest not and iodine is the least reactive, the weakest oxidizing agent. This one was four marks. What is the formula for triosulfate? I'm going to put it, look to the bottom right of the screen. That's the formula for, for sodium triosulfate. I right, take a screenshot at this point. I'm going to clear part of the board again. Just take a screenshot if you haven't finished writing from the board. All right, so the next question, no part C, it's our next four marks question. All right, so in terms of reactiveness with hydrogen, the reactivity decreases as I go down the group. And that is because of the, um, the E value as well. Well, it depends how they want it. I would, don't think it would be the E value you would use to explain it. It's a part of it, but in terms of this one, we can use the size of the atom as well, as in why the, in general, why the halogens are so reactive. All right. What I'll just explain. So basically, 
the smaller the atom, the easier it is to pull an electron towards itself. So the, the reactivity of the halogens and non-metal in general, the ability to pull electrons towards itself. So the E naught is showing is one indication of how easy it is to pull electrons towards itself. All right. So fluorine is a very small atom. It just needs one electron to become stable. So it is easy to just pull an electron from hydrogen. As the atoms get larger, it is more difficult. Right? I can't go in much more details to simplify it, but as of time, but just know that the smaller the atom or your non-metal, the easier it is to plan electrons toward itself. And that is why fluorine is your is your is the most electron negative atom. All right. There are more. There are more than one things we could use. All right. So it asks us to describe. So we start with fluorine. All right. Before we describe, let us state the trend. All right. So describe the reactions of halogens with hydrogen. So you made a mistake. Tell me supposed to be at the front and you have to off the group. All right, so the reactions of allergen starts out very explosive okay, at the top of the group and decreases down the group.
sir. Go ahead. Somebody said, sir. I did. For the chlorine, you put um, sunlight. Does it yeah. definitely... Does it definitely has to be sunlight or as long as it, it is exposed to light? Uh, sunlight. I'm not sure if, this, if it is the case where it's like UV light with alkanes, but I didn't double check. But in the book, it's sunlight. Yeah, so I'm not sure if it's a case where it's sunlight or UV. I don't think it would be any light. Because like with reactions of alkanes, when we say sunlight, it's actually just UV light that we need. So I'm assuming it's possible that it's probably UV light and sunlight is the source of it. Flame. I'm not certain of that. Give me a second to plug in. And hold on, it's not charging. All right, ready? All right, so unit tools. The person that talks about unit, it's on Friday and Sunday. The link, or the timetable, I think it was posted on the community channel. I will post it again. All right, so that was about the reactions of halogens with hydrogen. The next part of the question, is explain the trend in relative stability of the hydrides. Again, this one is about trends. I'm going to erase now, so if you would not finish, just take a screenshot of it. I have to stop sharing for a second. I'm not seeing something I need to see. All right. Bio, bio is unit one. About next Tuesday or Wednesday, I will post it on the channel as to the day and the time. I'm going to just go to the board now. Okay. All right, so part of that, C1, or so we're now at C2. And C2 wants us to explain the trend.
Yeah, go ahead. So for the previous question, somebody asked if flame can't be one. I did not. Maybe I would have to check. What I, I didn't check as to, as to the exact condition other than sunlight. I would have to check it. But you can ask them if they saw it somewhere. It says flame can use. Mm. All right, I will check it before class ends. Oh, the hydride here is hydrogen halide. The stability of the hydrogen halide decreases. Anybody want to tell me why? Which, which one of the explanation would you use for the stability? So you really speak about the bond energies? Right. So which, I know I just curious the table, but do you remember which one of them are the highest? And so yeah, I believe it was hydrogen fluoride. Right, that is correct. So, uh, and as you go from fluorine to chlorine, it decrease, right? So for this one, it's about the band energy. All right, so the stability of the hydrogen halide decreases. And this was three marks, so let me just put that. Again, with question like these, you can just put it in your own words. So hydrogen fluoride has the highest bond energy and therefore the most stable. Yes, that is correct, the person that was texted in the group. All right. And the final question for two marks.
Remember, the hydrogen is a atomic molecule. So you must not put H, it's H2, it's a gas. Chlorine is also a atomic molecule, it exists as a gas, and that would give you hydrogen fluoride and put a twin front to, to balance it. All right, so this was 2018. I'm going to do a part of 2017 to cover a particular reaction I want to show you. As I said, I'm just using the past paper to go through the topic. Sir. Yes. Um, so right this, right this way, um, the hydrogen halides of the, the bond energy decreases going down the group, right? That's like, why does it decrease? Is it because um, the intermolecular forces um, decrease? That right? is correct. But intermolecular force, so hydrogen for that's the strongest intermolecular force, that is hydrogen bond. Right. Well, all of them would be hydrogen bomb, but this would be the strongest, the HF. Remember, wait, go ahead. Um, so is it true that um when I read somewhere one time so that say um H HF is an acid, right? But the message is a weak acid. Is that true? Hydrofluoric acid? Yeah, it's, a weak acid. Weak. it's not or it is. No, it couldn't be a weak acid. HF. Yeah. No, so if no man, it can be weak. The same thing I think. Mm -hmm. I, that's strong man. Hydrofluoric, hydrochloric, those would be strong acids. The organic ones would, would be weak. All right, so I'm going to clear the screen. Look for the 2017. There's a part of it I want to work. Let me find it quickly. Right. Just take a screenshot if you are still writing. I want to clear the board. So, sir, um, yeah, what you are right? Is that correct? Also, repeat. repeat. What you are right? Is it also correct? And uh, let me check. As covalent bonds get weaker, yes, down the group, less energy is required for decomposition. So is that really true? Because the bonds get energy? weaker, because the bonds are weaker, that would be why you have the, the bond energies decreasing going down. But not the covalent bond. Oh, oh, that's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Say, no? Referring to the intermolecular, the intermolecular force to, rather than the actual covalent bond. Y yes, sir. Well, not to spend too long on this, but you would actually go into bond length if you want to take it there. But you don't have to go there. So, well, we say, they said the atomic radius decreases. Is that true? I think the opposite, actually. Um, the radius are going to increase. As you go down the group, the atoms are get bigger. Did she, did she say decrease or increase? Oh, say increase, sorry. Yeah, man. I'm just clear all of this one time. All right, so for 2017, they asked us to 
So this is number three. Right? Then we're going to move on to transition metal after this. So this is 2017, number three. So, sir, excuse me for confirmation. Yeah. What Tiana had was also correct. Yes, because remember, let me, what, let me just read it again. She said, as the covalent bonds get weaker down the group, less energy is required. Covalent. So, um, right, so with bond energy, I'm just saying it, it's not bond energy now, under the intermolecular force fabric. So let's clear it up. All right. So it's actually, so what she said there, covalent bond. It wouldn't be the bond. It wouldn't be the. It wouldn't be the hydrogen bond that we are referring to. It's actual HF bond now in this case. So bond energy, we're looking at the energy released when one of those bonds are broken. So choose the word covalent bond. It's good. So basically this question, they wanted to relate to bond energy. Anything surrounding bond, anything surrounding bond energy in how your Fraser answer will work, it should be phrased around the energy of the bonds, and not the intermolecular force. And so question A1, it asks us to find the term. Find the term, proportionation. Before I define it, that was A1, A2. I'm going to use the equation to show you what it means. That is correct. So the second question says that the balanced equation All right, so the reaction above that they were referring to says KCLO3. It 
0.03 undergoes disproportionation when heated. Produce KCL and KClO4. So write up this equation. So let's check if the atoms are balanced. So on this side we have three oxygen. On this side we have four. Potassium is already equal. I'm going to double check. I didn't balance it, but if you have the four three combination, I think you will need a four on this side, the three on this side. I will double check. I think it will end up being a four three combination. Three potassium one here, that's four. Four chlorine, three times one three and one four chlorine. All right, four times three, 12 oxygen, four trees, 12. All right, I think that should be good. All right, now it says calculate the oxidation number of chlorine, KClO3 and KClO4. We don't need to calculate it for this because we know that potassium is in group one, so its oxidation state is known. We know that chlorine is in group seven, therefore it is minus one. However, let's look at KClO3. Remember, for group seven elements, their oxidation state is going to be negative one, except when they are bonded with oxygen. So if you don't remember how to do oxidation state, the first thing we should do is look, if the, by the way, there's no oxidation of that topic, but oxidation comes under group seven, all right? Especially with the displacement reactions, right? So even though they say no oxidation, oxidation is a part of group seven. All right, so you look at the compound, it has no charge at the top. Meaning, so like for sulfate, it has a charge of two minus. Here, you do not see a charge. When you add up the individual oxidation numbers, it should be equal to the overall charge. So we don't see any charge, it should give you zero. The oxidation state for oxygen is negative two. And we have three oxygen atoms. And we are trying to find chlorine, so that would be X. Sir, I don't think I quite understand how you got the equation. So the, the question, it says, KCLO3 undergoes disproportionation. So they told us, you know, so part two that says write the balance equation for the reaction above, where they told us that this, when you heat it, you will get KCL and KClO4. Oh, all right, sir. All right. Right, so chlorine is X. And then we know that potassium is in group one. So we know that we want X to be by itself. Or before we do that, Let's go again, three times negative two, that is negative six. It's negative six plus X plus one. So we want X by itself, X would be negative six, sorry. X would be positive six minus one, that is positive five. 
So over here, chlorine is positive five. Over here, if we check, let's go again. Wait, this should not be three, two, six. This should be four. And so this should be eight. Oh, I was working out case CLO three, not four. Yep. But it's the same thing, all right? So let's just switch them out. Then this would be eight minus one, and you would get seven. All right, so plus five for this and plus so this is plus seven, and over here is plus five. For this proportionation, right? Let's look at what happened. We start out with this compound, right? In attention to chlorine, oxidation state was plus five. If you look over here, it has an oxidation state of minus one, and it also has an oxidation state of plus seven. So basically, this same compound, it was both oxidized and reduced. So that is this proportion, basically. Chlorine was both oxidized and reduced. Um, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sorry for the bother. Um, could you please go over um the ionization part, like the reduction and the oxidation? Then how I calculated it? Yes, sir. All right. All right, I, prob I can give you an, if you have a problem with the maths part, you can show you next way on your, on your check, all right? So, of first thing you do, look if you have a charge here. You do not see a charge, all right? So try this and see if it can help. Oh, I'm not sure that now. Let's just work with the maths. Okay, look if it has a charge, right? Do not see any charge. That means when you add up the oxidation state for potassium, chlorine, and oxygen, the answer you should get is zero. Now, the rules for oxidation states says that oxidation state for oxygen is always negative two, except in peroxides. So we know that oxygen is negative two based on the rule. In this compound, of four of it. So four times negative two, that is negative eight. We should end up back to our answer of zero. We are trying to figure out chlorine. So we let chlorine be X. Anything you are trying to find out, we let X represent it. Potassium is in group one. If the element is in group one, it has an oxidation state of plus one. So all we are doing is adding up the oxidation state for each element. The minus eight is for oxygen. The X is for chlorine. The plus one is for A. It's K plus C plus O4. All right. So we're trying to find X. So we're keeping X by itself. We bring everything else across the equal sign. I mean, minus eight across the equal sign becomes positive eight. I mean, positive one across the equal sign, it becomes minus one. And so the answer is plus seven. Okay, thank you, sir. This equation, it was, all right, let me write it for you. All right. 
So the question that said, is CLO3, is a different thing. Question three, it started out like this. So this was stated at the top of the question. I just basically write the equation for what was stated. And so that is how I got the equation. It said case CLO3 and heated produces KCL and KClO4. Right. So this proportionation is a reaction in which a compound undergoes both oxidation and reduction. As if you notice here, it was being reduced and here it was being oxidized. If you remember oxidation, in terms of oxidation state, Oxidation is, is the increase in oxidation state. And here we see it move from positive five to positive two. I mean, plus seven. So that is oxidation. We know that reduction is a decrease in oxidation state. That's positive five to negative one. So both oxidation and reduction occurred starting with single compound, right? So that's disproportionation. Part B, it was a repeat. I'll give you a minute and we'll move on to a table. Sir, what did you say? Equation to get the five. You repeat. What did I? What did you say to get the equation to get the plus five? How, do, how did I get the plus five here? Yes, sir. All right. We'll do that quickly and then we we'll move. All right. All right. So, again, as I said, the first thing I do look if the 
to have any charge on the compound or the, the ion. So if you add two minus here, then when you add up everything, the answer should be equal to negative two. Then that's how you start out the equation, all right? But if you look at it and you don't see a number at the top, it should be equal to zero. And when you look, there is no number, so it should be equal to zero. What you're going to do is multiply the number of atoms So let's do this now, all right. So three, two, six. Plus chlorine, we're trying to find is X. Potassium is in group one, plus one. Three twos, negative six, plus X, plus one. All right, I want X to be the subject. I'm going to bring everything across the equal sign. Negative six goes across, it becomes positive six. Positive one goes across, it becomes negative one. So negative one minus positive six minus one, that is equal to positive five. All right. All right, so next question now. I'm going to clear the board, so just take a screenshot if anything. All right, so I'm going to put some test and we're going to fill out the observation. So the first test, all right, I shouldn't put the question. So again, we're still on, we are still on 2017, I'm doing part C. Part B is something that repeat from 2018. All right, so part C now it says MX.
All right, I'm going to start that part three and go up. No, before I do that, anybody have an idea of which halogen it is? The ideas as to which halogen? It says the RAM of the halogen is 80. Um, bromine. Right, because it's going to be fluorine or chlorine. And iodine is heavier. All right, so we know it is our halogen. Halogen is bromine. All right, so if I pass chlorine through X, right? What we are doing. All right, so I'm answering this part of the question. They say pass chlorine, all right? So we have chlorine reacting it with X is a halogen. For example, let me give an X reaction. What is basically happening is chlorine, for example, with sodium iodide, all right? What is going to happen? Sir, chlorine will displace iodine. That is correct. So that means for this equation, all right, let's do it up here. So you'll get sodium chloride plus I2. That means down here, what should we get? What? What should we get? MCL, MCL, MCL X plus X. Right, MCL plus just X it has to be X what? X2, X2. right, because remember it is representing a halogen. And the halogens are diatomic. And since, it is, since as it is bromine, is the color of bromine? Red brown. Right. So since X is bromine, we expect what color again? We expect red brown. Red brown, red brown color. Right. I thought we say a red brown. So any area want to put it, all right? But I'm just writing a red brown color will be produced. If you want to say this solution will turn red brown, however you want to say it. All right. But this one no. So we know we are testing again for the bromide ion, which is a halogen. So if we add silver, and once we use silver and nitrate, we are testing for the halogens. So we need the table. Well, it did not give us two marks. So we are going to need an observation for silver nitrate. And we're going to use, we're going to need an observation for concentrated ammonia. So when we add silver nitrate, if bromide ion is present, does anyone know what we should observe? Cream color. All right. We're going to get up. We're going to actually get up. Precipitate, so put cream, precipitate. Precipitate will form. Now, when we add the concentrated ammonia, what will happen? The cream precipitate would dissolve in concentrated ammonia. That is correct. Sir, if I said the color of the precipitate was white, then would I mark me down for that? Yeah, because a chlor. The, the white precipitate would indicate X is 
chlorine. So chloride ion, when it forms the precipitate of silver chloride, that is white, the bromine is cream, and the iodide will give you a pale yellow color. All right, so the color makes a, yeah, it's important to put it. So white is for chloride ion, cream is for iodide, and the yellow is for the iodide ion. Now does anyone know what will happen or which, which reaction is taking place with the, the sulfuric acid when we react it? So now the, um, now the first form, um, sodium hydrogen, something, you know, I get, um, so that's so the displacement reaction. So uh, with this one, when you react them with sulfuric acid, so when you react salt with bromide, with bromide ion, two types of reaction occur. But in the, so two reactions occur. But in the second reaction, so in the first one, you will get hydrogen bromide. And in the second reaction, the first, this MX going to react with, with the sulfuric acid. As the person said, you would get the NaH SO4 and HBr. Then the HBr now is going to react again with sulfuric acid and you get sulfur dioxide and Br2. Reddish brown so, liquid. That's sir, can I please? Gas. Uh, sir, this, this table is about um, aqueous and solid um, halides. Say that again. If it's, if it's with what? If this table is based on um, aqueous halides and solid halides. It's a mix. This is like a kind of like qualitative, but it's specific to halogen. All right, so you see the, this one here, it's, so let me change, switch ink. So this one, it's about, this is redox reactions. All right, let me not, redox slash displacement. All right, so column three, it is displacement. This one here is qualitative analysis. Qualitative analysis. All right. And this one is a specific reaction of the halogens with sulfuric acid. All right. So MX, so we would have gotten, all right, let me clear off the question from up here. So we are going to get two gas, right? Um, Open up the question already. All right, so let me give you a typical example, and then you can switch it out with MX. So sodium bromide, sulfuric acid, Get sodium hydrogen sulfate, and it would be HBr. Then the HBr reacts with sulfuric acid, and that will give you sulfur dioxide, Br2, and water. I'm going to post a section of the, it's in the study guide. I'm just going to screenshot that part and post it in the community section. All right, but basically, right, so when you react MX, so MX is basically just like sodium bromide. I'm going to put Na is like MX. So MX is like sodium bromide. That means 
we are going to get SO2 and Br2. What do we know about SO2 in terms of what would be choking gas? All right. The descriptor choking acidic gas, right? So it is also pungent, right? We normally use pungent with ammonia. The, the description as if it is choking acidic. Normally it's pungent for ammonia. So what about the color? Most the color? It's colorless. It's NO2 as a color. So we are going to do transition and qualitative. So we will look at the colors. So we will get a choking acidic gas produced. Sorry, something is in the way. Right, so we'll get a choking acidic gas being produced. And then bromine, what is the color of it again? Or bromine? Red brown. Right. Sir, could the choking acidic gas observation be used for all halogens? No, man, the choking acidic gas is for SO2. Let me just make that. So this is for SO2, and this right here is for Br2. Because if you look at the reaction here, you are going to get SO2 and Br2. Wait, you mean, oh, I understand what you're asking. So for this reaction here, Chlorine, all right, so let me just finish this and make a note on the board, as not all of them will, will actually do it. So question, oh, you know that MX was on sodium bromide, say? Oh, so, so, the gen so the reason why they put MX, right, is that from the notes, right, when you react a salt with halide salt, with sulfuric acid, this is the reaction, the specific one for, for bromide. They get hydrogen buried in the first part of the reaction. And in the second part, the HBr reacts with sulfuric acid, give SO2, Br2, and water. There's two, it's two, two reactions that actually, um, this is the, first one and this is the second one. So, so because we know that X is bromine, that is why we know that these two products would be produced. Understand? So I understand that part, but I don't understand how we get it to be sodium bromide. Oh, no, man. I'm just giving an example, you know. I'm not saying MX is sodium bromide, you know. I'm just giving an example that says, for something, for example, if MX is sodium bromide. So I'm just showing an example of the actual reaction of a halide salt. So this is an actual example. So they are just, remember, X is just a random compound, arbitrary one, MX. I'm saying MX can be sodium bromide. And this is the reaction that would occur. So we know that this is the reaction that occurs. So we are expecting SO2 and Br2. I just use the sodium bromine as a specific example for explanation purposes. Is it any clearer? Yeah, man. Say. Much clearer. Yeah, man. All right. Yeah, man. All right.
All right, we have to move to transition metals now. Okay, so I'll give you a minute, right? And then we start transition metals. I will check about this syllabus afterwards. And if there's anything you need to know about chlorine, I'm going to post it. If there's anything Sir. I left out, I'm going to post it after. Sir, yeah. um, suppose, I never, suppose I was never bromine. Suppose I was iodine. Oh, oh yeah, I right. I was, right. So, all right, let me just put the equation for those two. All right. Sir, yes. can the choking acidic gas observation be used for all reagents? All right, so that is what I'm doing now. So for chlorine, all right, so they say chlorine is not a strong enough oxid as an agent. All right, so, so for this, so for sulfuric acid, let's make a note. No reaction with chlorine. And this is um, with uh, SO2, right? Right. And so let me just state the art. Let me state it properly. All right, so no reaction between They say chloride ion is not strong enough of a, of a using agent. I shouldn't say no reaction, but you will only get the first part of the reaction. So let me change that. For example, if it was sodium chloride, it would just stop at step one. But it wouldn't be an oxidation. It wouldn't be a redox reaction. So you would get this and it stops there. Right. So you wouldn't get this sulfur being reduced. Yes, sir, based on what you are showing now, Vince, so that means that the more you go down, the more you go down at the allergen group, group seven, the stronger is reducing agent. Right. And so iodine. It go up. It's a strong oxidizing agent. The reverse. 
But when when you really say it like that, because generally halogens are non-metals except electrons, they get reduced to oxidizing agent. Yeah. I'll go up. Yeah. Metals are reducing agents, non-metals tend to be oxidizing agents. Yes, so what I said is correct. All right, for iodine, I'm going to put the equation now for iodine. So they have three equations for, for iodine. So the first one is always the same. I'm going to use sodium again. If it was sodium iodide, I rack it with sulfuric acid, you would get NaH, SO4, and HI. The second part now, HI reacts with sulfuric acid. You get the SO2. I2 and H2. But iodine, like the bromine, HI, it's three sets of reaction with this one. HI plus H2SO4 can actually reduce SO2. And I'm going to balance it. But I'm going to check if you have to know these equations. I don't think you have to know them. But I'm going to check if the, the syllabus requires you to know these particular equation. All right. And confirm. I will confirm before the class ends. Mm -hmm. So, sir, um, I then can reduce the sulfuric acid to just um sulfur. Single and deadly. Wait, a three equation I put right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Let's see, let me mix up down there. Oh, so four. Yeah. Let me move this one first. I'm going to balance it as well. What I need to, I think I just study the products of the, the possible products that you can get with these reactions. So when you use, it's a chlorine, we know chlorine will just stop here. So the important part to know for chlorine, no reduction of sulfur. All right, so with chlorine, we don't get any reduction of sulfur. With bromine, we get SO2. And sulfur is in the plus four oxidation state here. So chlorine, no reduction of sulfur. Or the bromine carry to SO2, which is plus four. And the iodine can carry completely zero. Here we see it, it would, the oxidation state here is zero. If it's in H2S, it's plus two. 
So iodine is the one that can reduce it the most. Sir, is it plus two or negative two? Which one? The last one here. Where is it? Oh, yeah, thank you. Hydrogen is positive, so it would be negative. Thank you for that. All right. All right, so that's it for chlorine. Wait, we have a long way to go. We have module two. All right, let's run through some transition methods quickly. I just take a picture of the board. I'm going to clear it. All right, so take a picture of the board. I'm going to clear it. Get the transition method this time. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I have a question, sir. Because in the previous question, sir, we talked about the um the halogen being an oxidizing agent, right, sir? Yes. And then right here we're saying that chlorine is not a strong enough reducing agent. So why we start talking about reducing agents? Sir? So this part, uh, this particular reaction, okay. Okay, generally because non, look at non-metals, metals are reducing agents because they give up electrons and non-metals gain electrons, which makes them oxidizing agents. That would be in this particular instance. But I have to move up and really get any more attention, all right? To go to the yeah the transition methods and I want to do module two as well. All right, so we're going to move a little a little faster now. All right, so I'm going to raise the question. Let's give me a second. Yeah. Sorry, if you have time, could you please just brush over module one, two? I'm not going to have the time for my I'm not going to promise, but if I can do something early in the morning. I will do, but I'm not going to promise. So for tonight, I try to complete module three and two. So question six part eight says list four properties of transition of transition metals. So they have a high density. So they are magnetic properties. Right. Use as catalyst. That is correct. Form um, colored complexes. All right. Fluctuate absolute state. All right, so let's go again. So we say they, they form colored compounds. Right. Paramagnetic. All right. So, so they are. Magnetic properties. Someone said catalytic properties as well. By a melting and boiling point.
was one of the general characteristics of it to be more like these. But they do have a melting on selling point though. They also have various oxidation state. Well, that would be a property. A melting on boiling point. All right, let me include that. All right, let me see if I'm leaving any out. Complex ions, right? That is correct. All right. Yes. have high density. All right, so we can close it with those seven. Sir, um, yes. we can look on the electronic configuration of the transition metals, the D block metals. They, not one of them. They are they are D block elements. Yes, sir. And anomal anom. Yeah, I'm going to if it's if you're referring to copper and uh, copper and chromium, yeah, I'm going to highlight it. The anom. And with candium and zinc not being transition metals. So part B1, it wants us to write the electronic configuration of titanium. Right, electronic configuration of the titanium ion. So let's just look at electronic configuration in general. So before we answer this one, let's just look at some. All right, so the order in which we, we write is 1s and 2s and 2p, 3s, 3p, 3D, 4S, 
Honest to us. So it doesn't force us come for it. Fill the four S. We're going to fill the four S before the three D. And the past papers, I realized I put three D in first and then four S. Should make a difference. But sir, isn't the way you write it right now a true representation of how the transmission metal occupy them electron? Um, because it's normally 3D with a full up before the 4S for the transition. No, actually, 4S, if you remember, mm -hmm. so let's do this quickly. There, so you have N equal one, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the one S. Then you have N equal two, the two P and the two S. Then you have N equal three, with the three D, 3P and 3S. Then I have N equal 4, 4D and so forth. But the only one we are going to use is 4S. And the 4S is actually lower in energy. So N equal 4, equal 3. N equal 4, the 4S is actually lower in energy and the 3D. So we actually fill 4S before you fill 3D. But when we are writing it like this, it's in terms of the energy level. So you realize 1S come first, then you have 2S and 2P, the N equal 3 energy level, right? The 4S is not a part of N equal 3. It's 3S, three 3P, three and 3D that is a part of N equal 3. 4S is a part of the N equal 4, which is a different energy level after you pass N equal 3. So that is why some do it like this. This is how I see they do it on the CAPE exam. Now, the reason why you put why we would put 4S and then 3D, because you fill the 4S before you fill 3D. But I'm just doing it like how I see they do it on the CAPE exam. When they write, some do it 3D, 4S, some put 4S and then 3D. The CAPE class papers, they put the 3D before the 4S. So that's the only reason I'm doing it, why I am putting it like this now. Because really, and you fill the 4S and the 3D. This is how it looks on the cape as papers. All right. So that's the reason. All right. So, with that said, let's do some now. Right, so, let me just clear this. All right. So, for Titanium, scandium, titanium. Titanium is 22, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 4s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3s, 3p6, 4s2, that's 20. It's supposed to be a D. This is 3d2, that would be 22, right? Now, when you are taking away an electron, you take it out. So remember, N equal 4 contains the 4S. N equal 3 contains 3D. That means N equal 4, N equal 4, the 4S, 4S is further away or further away. So, 4S is further away from the nucleus than 3D. So, we take electron from 4S first. All right, so just remember this. When you're going to take away electrons, 
you take it away from the 4S because it is further away from the nucleus. The titanium ion, titanium, the plus are scandium is three plus, titanium is two plus. Well, in this one, it's three plus. Then the question, sorry. The question that they gave us, it said titanium, titanium three chloride, right? So we are doing the electronic configuration for Ti three plus. That means we should take away. So this is the electronic configuration for titanium. So titanium three plus, we're going to take away two from the four S and take away one from the three D. It would be one S two, two S two, two P six, three S two, three P six, three B one. All right. They take away from the four S first. And so the question asks for the titanium ion. Sir. Yes. Why couldn't we take all of it from the forest? We took away, remember, remember the forest only have two, you know. And it's T I three plus, you know, not two plus. So the four S has two electrons. But based on the charge and the ion, it lost three electrons. So we took two from the four S as it only have two. Then we take from the three D. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right. But sir, what about chloride? No man, the chloride is for a different question. Remember, we are just doing the electronic configuration for the transition metal. So the question said, write the electronic configuration of the titanium ion. The compound was titanium three chloride. So the titanium ion is Ti three plus. All right, let's practice a little more and then we move to the next class, to the next part of the class paper question. So they could ask you for the, for the box. Hmm? Let me put it back quickly. All right, I'm going to put it back and take a screenshot. All right, so take a screenshot and then I'm going to erase and we continue again. Okay, sir, got it. Thank okay. you. Give me a second, I'm blocking some comments. Some but or whatever and they the live. All right, let's go again. So 
Okay, so this is just practice now, all right? It's so the same PI three plus. I could ask you for chart and chart and to start with the nearest noble gas. For transition metals, if you ask to write the short and format, you start with argon. You just write the R. Remember, argon is 18. That means it covers from 1s2 all the way to 3p6. All right. So titanium. So if we're doing titanium, it would be. Argon, I put 3D, 4S. All right, you see argon, 4S2, that is 20. All right, so just know that argon and 4S2, that is 20. So if titanium is 22, know that 20 and 2, that's 22. PI, 3 plus, would be argon, 3D, 1, because it loses 2 and 1 from the D. The box method, right, the argon, and you draw the D orbital boxes. So we know the D orbital, it holds 5 box and 10 electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this would be 3D, and this would be the 4S. So for titanium, again, so for titanium, you would have two in the 4S and two in the 3D. Then for Ti, three plus, Argon, you would not need the 4S again. So that would be it. So whether they want the box method or this. So this is shortened. And so quickly write off this for me. I want to explain something about copper and chromium. I'm going to face it now. I'm only going to do short and right, so we're going to do MN plus five. So manganese is 25. Sir, you're supposed to subtract the, the mang manganese and the argon, right? Repeat. 
Don't You're supposed to subtract the manganese and the argon? Mm. Then say subtract manganese and argon. What do you mean? As in the atomic numbers. No. And then we're doing the short hand? Yes, sir. All right. So argon, atomic number is 18. And if you do 18, it stops at 3P6. So after 3P6, it's the 4S and the 3D. So argon is 18. So if manganese is 25, it's, eight, it's 18 plus 2, that's 20. And 5, that is 25. That's done? Oh, yes, yeah. sir. Thank you. Um, all right. So, I mean, in the plus five oxidation state, we'll take away the two from the 4s and three from the 3d orbital. So, we we'll need the 4s again. It would be argon 3D2. All right. And then now for the box method. This wouldn't work. I want to need something higher than that. Iron is 26. Cobalt 27. I want to use cobalt. Four plus. I'm just trying to just want to show you a point. All right. So cobalt is 26, cobalt 27. All right. It would be argon. That's cobalt. Oh no, would have been the four S. We are going to take away electrons from the D orbital. If all of them are filled already. So let me come over here so as well. So we know that we we'll take away the two electrons from the 4s. Then we we'll take away one, two, and three from the d orbital. All right, to we'll get Mn in the plus five oxidation state. For cobalt, now we are going to take away the electrons and start taking away from this one as yet. Take away the paired ones first, all right? So once the once the d orbitals are paired up, do not remove any from the end. Move from the paired orbitals first. So that means Going to take away the two from the four S. Then 
they're going to take away the two from the cleared orbitals, all right? So this is how it sh should look. All right, so we take away from the paired orbitals first, and then we we'll start taking from the end. Yes. Please do one more example. All right, let's do that quickly. Going to erase some of the board now so you can take a picture of it. Nickel generally stops at two plus, but this is just for explanation purposes. I'm going to put four plus. of the two in the four is, remember you fill your orbitals one at a time, so that's 25, and then three more. And also they should be undone when you're appearing them. All right, so that's 28. Let's do Ni four plus. Remember we said, we start with the 4S. So that would be removed. This one has three paired orbitals, right? So you, you take away electrons from the paired orbitals first. If it's plus four, so it must lose four electrons. And so we take away two from here. They start taking from this end. So you take away this and this. 
So this should still be paired up, all right? When you are taking away electrons from the d orbital, you start from this end down. But once it is paired up, you start taking away the paired orbitals first. Let's even for the explanation. Let's make it a little higher. Let's make it six plus. If it is six plus. should lose six. It should lose these two, all of these three, should lose this one as well. All right, so that's three paired ones, plus these two, that is a total of five. And then it should lose one more, that would make it six. All right, so that is all your takeaway electrons. All right, so quickly, take off this one, let us continue. All right, there is something unusual about copper and chromium. So you can be asked to write it and explain. I'm going to do that quickly now. All right, so chromium atomic number is 24. So as we expect the electronic configuration, should be argon 3D4, 4S2, that is 24. However, that is not the case. For chromium, this is wrong. All right, so special is of chromium. So let us look at the, at the box method for chromium. Sir, you can let me screenshot the CR first. Oh, first. oh may I press the CR? Do you want to see the left side of the screen? Over here? No, sir, of that. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so, so for chromium 24, 
it was the normal configuration. This is 3D, this is 4S. So let's look at if it was 3D4, 4S2. So two here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. So because these two are close in energy, instead of having the paired, paired section here, would have election, election repulsion is better to just promote this into this here, all right? But the reason why chromium has its unusual structure is because an electron is promoted from the 4S orbital into the 23D orbital, all right? So it's because of electronic, because of electron promotion. All right, just remember that an election is promoted. That is why it is 4S1, 3D5, and not 3D4, 4S2. So they ask anything about what is unusual about the electronic configuration of chromium and he asks you to explain it. That is the reason, All right? An election is promoted from 4S to 3D because the two of them are close in energy to do that. So that's the reason for chromium. Is it Peter, question? So you said that the electron is promoted. Right. So remember, fill the 4S for the 3D, right? So it should have been 4S2, 3D4. So this should have been the electronic configuration. It is actually 3D5, 4S1. The reason given for that is that an electron is promoted from the 4S into the 3D, all right? So that's the reason that is given. Okay, sir. So what is it for chromium? For copper now. The number for copper is 29. So we know that that is argon. It is 29, it should have been 3D9, 4S2. Right. Again, this is not the case. The reason given for this one now is that in copper, the 3D orbital is lower in energy.
And so it is filled first. So just remember those two reasons for chromium and copper. Copper, 3D is actually filled before the 4S. In chromium, an election is promoted. So there is no promotion in copper, just in chromium. All right, so we're going to go back to the past paper now. I'm going to give a minute and then I erase the board. Whenever this class ends, it will be the video is available immediately on the channel. So the class and I in now, right? No rest mm. for the wicked. I go, go do rates and, and redox equilibrium and then close. Um, I go do transition to some rates and redox equilibrium and then close. If you do any module one in the morning, I'm post it. I do so, but I'm not sure. All right, so let's continue again. I'm going to create the board now. Transition methods, at least know some properties and know, all right, maybe now you raise your hand. Go ahead, if you have a question. I was just asking about um, what about energetics. I'm not going to get to do that. If I get to do it, I will try in the morning, but I'm not certain as it. Right? But I want to do module two. At least we get two modules out of the way. All right. So it's on your channel though, right? This, this one? Any energetics video? Just our neighbor cycle. Oh, okay, so yeah. Not for the broad topics. I have videos for module one, but it was I think it was a real relax. Right. Right, where was I? So now the electronic configuration, now what is unusual about chromium and copper. Also, why zinc and scandium, scandium titanium, yes. Why zinc and scandium are not actually transition metals. Let me just do that quickly. So zinc, atomic number is 30. All right, so zinc is 30. That would be argon 3D, 3D10, 4S2. And scandium is 21. 
that would be argon 3D1, 4S2. And so these are not actually transition metals. Let's look at why. All right, so zinc ZN2 plus would be argon 3D10. Right. And scandium C3 plus would be argon. It would only be argon. Transition metals. Form ions. unfilled B orbitals. All right. If you look at zinc, the entire D orbital for zinc is filled. Yeah. Remember, the transition metals, when they form their ions, the D orbital should be unfilled. Zinc is filled. If you look at scandium, scandium does not have any in the B orbital. So scandium and zinc are not actually transition metals. So zinc and scandium are not transition metals. Because the D orbital of zinc is filled. When it forms Zn2 plus. The B orbital for scandium is empty. When it forms C3 plus, all right? So this is an ex exception, you must. Remember, zinc and scandium, the thing about chromium and copper. All right, so in a couple of seconds, I'm going to erase, so take a screenshot if you need to. All right, I'm going to erase it now. So if you need to take a screenshot, also. All right, so the next part of the, so going back to the question now, let me find it. Right, so titanium, and so this was B2, right? So 
about 2016. Give me a second. Right, so This is for four marks. This question, it can come, just know it is asking, why are transition metals able to form colored complexes? All right, so I'm going to tell you why. It doesn't matter how they phrase the question, the answer is going to stay the same. So here, when they say tin tree chloride forms, a violet solution when dissolved in water, explain the color of the solution. Right? The answer is the same. You're basically asking why transition metals form colored compounds. All right, so for a transition metal, right? When they so the water, the ligand, all right? So for example, when you see we have, when we write iron, like Cu2+, plus, copper, Cu2+, plus, that is a simplification of the actual formula. None of these ions are just Cu2+, plus. they are bonded water, which is a ligand. All right, so when a ligand, so a ligand is any, any compound or ion with a lone pair of electron, all right? So water is able to form a dative covalent bond with copper. All right, so water, and form a bond with copper, a dative covalent bond, all right? We soon get to that part. But so, what I'm saying, all right, water is able to bond with the copper, not only water alone, chloride ion, ammonia. These are called ligands, all right? So a ligand is any compound, molecule, ion, once it has a lone pair of electron, right, that can donate to your transition metal to form a, COVID, to form a dative covalent bond, it is a ligand, right? Now remember, your transition metal, 
as its 5D orbitals. So any transition metal, it has its D orbitals. One, two, three, four, five of them. When I'll, can you repeat about the ligands? Right, so I was saying, I'll, so when you have your transition metals, they can form a bond with certain compounds. All of these compounds have something in common. They have a lone pair. So any molecule, ion, or compound, once it has a, a lone pair, it can act as a ligand because it can form a dative covalent bond with your metal ion, whether it's copper, iron, manganese, right? Any of your transition metals, that's a ligand. All right. So once it can form a bond with the copper or any transition metal, that's a ligand. All right. Now, what I'm focusing on, what I'm focusing on here is to answer this question. Why we get colored complexes from the transition metals. So we have the, we have the five D orbitals here. They have the same energy level. When they, when they form a bond with a, a ligand, they will not be of the same energy level again. They will be split into different energy levels. All right. For example, you have three below and two above. All right. So the first point to make in why condition metals form colored complexes when they form a bond with a ligand, the D orbitals split into two sets. One that is higher in energy. I'm going to put it in words after, after I have explained it. And this is lower in energy. All right. No, electrons are down here, right? Some may be up here already. We all know from module one, right? That when electrons get excited, so when they absorb energy, they can move from uh, the ground level or a lower energy state to higher energy state. They must have somewhere to go, right? So these orbitals at the top, they can't be filled. They must have room for electron. The transition metals, when they bind with the ligand, the D orbital split, two sets of energy, right? The electrons in the lower energy level, they can absorb when they absorb the light, they move up, all right? And when this, all right, just give me a second. So let us say this is a solution and visible light is going through it, right? This is a solution of transition metal, right? Light is passing through. Remember, visible light is a spectrum of colors, right? The electron here, there's a specific energy gap. Electrons absorb the energy and move up, right? When that happens, some light will be absorbed, some is going to pass through, all right? And that is the reason why we are going to, they are going to form colored complexes, the electrons, absorbing energy and moving up. It is kind of simple, three-step process. Form a bond with the ligand, the orbital split into two energy levels, 
electrons absorb the light, get excited, and move up. Is that clear? Sorry, can you put that in words on the page? Yeah, yeah, man, I'm going to do that now. Before I do, zinc. Zinc does not form colored complexes. Based on my explanation just now, can anybody tell me why Zn2 plus, why Zn2 plus would not form color, would not form colored complex? As a field, As a field the orbital. The orbital. Yes, indeed. It is field, right, and that is. Type. That is correct. So these at the top have to be unfilled. And in zinc, it is filled. All right. So I want to do three things at the same time, I guess. Copper. All right. Copper sulfate, when it's in its hydrated form, right? If I say it's copper hydrated, it's hydrated copper. What does that mean? Hydrated copper sulfate. Anybody? So contains water. All right. So, all right. It is blue. So hydrated copper sulfate, it is blue. If you have a heat copper sulfate in the lab, no. you? all right. If you heat the copper sulfate, it becomes white. So now I just Hydrated copper sulfate is blue. Anhydrous copper sulfate is white. Anybody know what anhydrous mean? We don't the want water, water. or dehydrate. Right. All right. Remember, water is a ligand, right? What do ligands do to transition? Metals. So there's a 3D block. Is it? Sir, they split the 3D block of two levels. In order. Right. Once the d orbitals split into two separate energy levels, they have the ability to do what? Absorb color in the form of absorb light. Right. That is correct. So if you remove water from copper sulfate. What ability have you taken away from copper sulfate? The ability to absorb light in order to. That is correct. If you take away the ligand, the d orbitals will not be split. You cannot absorb the light. So, a possible question is this copper sulfate in its hydrated form is blue, the anhydrous form it is white. Explain the change. All right. So let me put this in words now. So the exam, if tomorrow is the exam, so you don't must remember everything. So before I even write, when the ligand bind, the d orbital split, two separate energy levels, electrons at the lower one absorb energy, move up. That is how they absorb the light. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to clear this the big screen now and answer it. All right, so well, not all of the screen. I'm just serious.
Mm -hmm. Once finished, I'm going to explain it again. So is it should it be five D orbital? Mm -hmm. Should that be five D? No, I was all right. Let, let me not put the five. I was referring to the amount as in the five separate D orbitals within the three D level. Sir, sir, yeah. when the ligand arm um, binds to the transition metal, mm -hmm. how exactly does the ligand split the 3D orbital to make it into two separate energy levels? A repulsion. Let me say, based on the explanation, it means it's an electron repulsion. Does it? Because electrons are already electrons in the D orbital with the actions from the gun. So some get pushed to a higher energy, energy level. Sorry, that broke up. Can I repeat, please? So the explanation given is that the, there is action repulsion with the actions from the ligand and in the, in the D orbital. So some get pushed to a higher energy, energy level than others. So the ligands repel electrons in the transition metal, the D orbital specifically. And some of them go to a higher energy level than the others. Why it's split? Yeah. For this, all right, we can clear. You get it. Right. So electrons in the lower energy level.
All right, for the question on the right-hand side, once I say cause is splitting of the D orbitals, the explanation is this is the same as over here. All right, so you would just continue saying that electrons can move from the lower one to the higher one by absorbing light. So again, this question is basically asking why condition metals can form colored complexes, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to increase the question. I'm going to put the answer now for the anhydrous part. All right, so that's that's part about the colored complex. Everybody understand, just to check, everybody understand the, the role of a ligand or what it is? Yes. As as the ligand is just... Yes. Go ahead. Not quite sure. Not quite. So the ligand is just... All right, so your ligand 
is remember when I showed you, I'm not sure if you were there, in the other class with ammonia, right? Ammonia wants to form a bond with hydrogen ion. Hydrogen does not have an electron, right? To form the bond. So ammonia can donate a pair of electron hydrogen. And so you would get NH4. So your ligand is going to form a bond with your transition metal. But to do that, you must have a lone pair of electron to donate. So the, so the ligand is any, anything with a lone pair. So once you have a lone pair, you can be a ligand. So the chloride ion, once it is a negative ion, it has a lone pair. So any negative ion, when you look at H2O, you have to remember, even though it is not shown, water has lone pairs of electrons. Ammonia, even though it is not shown in the formula, it has a lone pair. So anything with a lone pair or a negative charge is a ligand because it has at least one pair of electron to donate. So that's all the ligand is doing, forming a bond. All right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is, is it any clearer for you now? Uh, yes, it's All right. Yeah. Is anybody writing? If you're writing, just take a screenshot. I'm going to just clear the entire board. So I'm going to clear it now.
I need to hurry up because I'm a bit tired and I need to do module two, right? I'm going to show you ligand exchange. I don't know if that, but uh, what else? Yeah, I think that is just it that is left. So, got a picture of the screen. I tell you what, uh, five, let's take a five minute break, 9.35, we resume 9.40. Let me just put that on the screen. Okay, sir. Yeah. Go break.
All right, so this question, it's dealing with ligand exchange. All right, so uh, let me just put it down here. Just make a note of these ions and their colors. So as I was saying, see, when we do CO2+, plus, it's not actually just CO2+. Plus. This is actually what CO2 plus is. So when phosphate is blue, it's because water is bonded to copper. So this is actually the CO2 plus, right? That is blue. So this ion here, it is blue. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Why does the H two have a six? Repeat. Oh, because it's six. This six here is six water that is bonded to copper. Okay, sir. Yeah, and the four here means four chloride ion is bonded to copper. The reason why I have a two minus here. Remember, copper is two, two plus. The chloride ion is minus. It's basically basically positive two from copper plus the negative four of the four chloride ions. So the overall charge is negative two. The reason why this is two plus copper then there is plus two. Water is neutral, it does not have a charge. And so that is why you have those charges there. All right, so when copper is, let's so see, CuCl4, that's yellow green. All right, so what is going to happen? If you should, of a solution, right? So if you have Cu,
after you have cobalt to the question. You, yeah, man, no man, I'm going to answer the actual question. But instead of cobalt, it could have been copper. I'm just letting you know that this is it for copper because I'm going to do cobalt as well. All right, so we have copper, Cu, H2O, 6, 2 plus. When you add hydrochloric acid, is the chloride ion from the hydrochloric acid that we are interested in. All right, so what is going to happen? So this type of, what I'm doing now, is called ligand exchange. So all we are doing is switching out one ligand for the next one. So this is our transition metal. We are switching one ligand for the next one. Water is currently bonded to copper. So we add, we add hydrochloric acid. Chloride ion of the hydrochloric acid is going to displace water. So what you will get as the product is CuCl4 2 minus plus any amount of water that is in here, you put it back. So you should get six water. So four chloride ions are displacing six water. Chlorine is a bit chlorine is a bit large. That is why we can only put four, not six. All right. Because chlorine is, is large, that is why only four of it can hold. So this reaction here. It's an equilibrium reaction too. All right. So you have your solution, all right? Of copper, you add acid to it, chloride ion displaces water. So you get a solution of copper chloride. So my question is, what would you expect to observe for this equation? So like a color change? Yes. All right. So I'm just write it. All right. So what would be the the color change? Look over here. From blue to yellow green. Yellow green. Right. So a color change. I will say this. This solution. Will change. From. To. to colorless. It's a reason to yellow. No, green yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> green tired. <laughs> Not colorless. Uh, yellow green. Yellow green. All right. What was I going to ask? We have a next question. So this is a follow-up of this quick art. So let's just call this one R I. And this is I I. So when we add the acid, we say we would get a color change from blue to yellow green. Because when when water is attached to the copper, that is when it is blue. So let me just put that underneath. So 
Um, just a second. Happened here. And press something I'm not sure. Did I press? One second, let me see what I'm doing. No, not that. Right. Here it is. So this is blue. And this compound over here is yellow green. Bear in mind, this is an equilibrium reaction, right? If it's an equilibrium reaction, what would happen if I increase the amount of water? So it would change back to blue. It would change back to blue, that is correct. For the equilibrium, it would shift to the left. So it would come blue again. It would change back to blue because um, the water being outside acid. Re Repeat that again. Uh, it will um, turn back to blue because water is basically acting as an acid. Acid. It is a ligand because so you look at it from the from Le Chatelier's principle. If you increase the amount of water is up, product right. If you increase the amount of water present, it's going to shift the equilibrium to the left. Yes. So if the equilibrium shifts to the left, remember now it would be changing from the copper chloride to the copper with water. It would be going back from yellow green to blue. Right, the position of equilibrium shifts. All right. So it would go back from yellow green blue. Right, so with that said, now let's look at the question. It says describe what would be observed when HCl is slowly added to aqueous solution of copper. You have an idea of what would happen now, right? Sir. Okay, go ahead. Even if you're not sure exactly. I suppose. So, yeah. um, Sir, is that copper or cobalt? Cobalt. Mm -hmm. so I showed you an example with copper. It is the same thing that will happen with cobalt. So what do you think is going to happen? So, sir, um, it will change from basically blue right. to the yellow green. Uh, no, copper, right. Um, the cobalt, no, copper is blue. The cobalt, it water is pink. Let me just put the color change for you. So cobalt with water, H2O6. So this cobalt is pink. Right. Is anybody writing the copper equation? Everybody finish? I'm going to erase it. So let's just erase it. All right, let me start from here. So that is pink. When I react it with the Acid, all right. So let me put that CO Cl4 2 minus that is blue. So you can attempt your equation in the meantime. And tell me, yeah, at someone that tested the yeah, color change, it is correct. Give me a second.
perceptual cubes. What did I reply from? A second. I'm just removing some stuff from the comment section. All right. All right, so what would be the color change? Pink to blue. Pink to blue, right. And why is that? It causes um, chloride ions to please the water. All right. So our equation it would be, we start out with cobalt 2. So you see, even though they just put CO2 plus, remember they said it's a solute, an aqueous solution of CO2 plus. So since you have the knowledge now, you should know that. You should write, actually, H2O6. All right. And these are the ones that tend to come. Copper, copper and cobalt, these big and exchange, and the acid are ammonia. All right, so this, it would react with the 4HCl. Don't need to put the HCl. Four Cl minus, right? And you would get, as I said, Co Cl four two minus plus six water, right? And this they did not ask for the equation; just ask to describe what to be observed. I would expect to get the pink into blue color change. Right. And they also to explain the changes observed. So we know why we would get that change. All right, so we need to move to some to redox equilibrium. So just take off this and then we move to redox. Wait, sir, for the 2016 paper for CII, it asks for the ionic equation. So we're supposed to write the, the equation that you put on the board, right? Yes, if it asks, right. yeah, yeah, man, if it asks for it, yes. Put it. And for the, for the explanation, we already know what happened. The chloride displaced the water. You mentioned stability constant. I'm just going to post that in the thing.
All right, so I'm going to do electrochemistry now with redox equilibrium. So again, I'm just going to work a past paper to explain some of this stuff. Just clear everything. This one I'm going to do, this is from 20, 2018. So I'm just going to do Redux 2018 and the rates 2018 and close. All right, so 2018, number five. Redux, Libra. All right, so. Before I do the question, let's just move quickly, right? You should be able to draw a half cell. Well, um, you should know, know how to draw the she cell. All right, this is a half cell. So all you need to do is draw a container. So this is the G cell standard hydrogen electrode. This would be the salt bridge. So you should not you should know to draw and label it. That's your salt bridge. Inside of it, you would have hydrogen ions. Concentration, it must be one moles per dm cube. This is the platinum electrode. And here. Hydrogen gas will be entering inside of here. Let me just put H2 as hydrogen gas. It should be at a, at a pressure of 101 kilopascal. All right. It should have a temperature of 298 Kelvin. All right. So when I do this half cell, So when you're doing this half cell, right, everything should be at standard condition. So I'm just going to make a note here. So for the standard conditions, solutions, concentration is equal to one mole, per dm cube. 
right? The temperature, 298 Kelvin, if you are doing it in degree Celsius, is 25. Some I leave you note. And the pressure, pressure, 101 kilopascal, if you're doing it in atmosphere, one atmosphere. So for the standard hydrogen electrodes, when you're labeling it, you are using standard conditions. So you put everything on it. Yes, redox equilibrium was in it. All right. Let's say no more, right? So apart from joining the half cell, let us say you want to measure the cell potential of a next metal. So they can ask you to show the setup. If you want to measure the cell potential for a particular element. Um, Any sir, metal. Yeah, go ahead. Um, for, the, for the hydrogen ion um, concentration right there, so mm -hmm. it's from an acid, right? Yeah, man, um, yeah, man. But suppose it's like something like phosphoric acid or like sulfuric acid. Would that be as you'd use a strong acid because weak acid wouldn't dissociate enough to get the one yeah, but, hmm? yeah, but like suppose you use sulfuric acid, right? You must have two H plus, you don't need two H plus. So would you, how much more should I use? Point, what more large should I be for that? Point oh, five? yeah, may understand who does it. But we'll use it. Well, they normally when you put one molar. So let's say put the one molar same way. But we understand why you say so, because if you use N5, that gives you twice the amount of hydrogen. Okay. But as in, you know, put any acid, you say no, you just put hydrogen ions. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so that are the difference. They put a H plus and its concentration. So you no need to put sulfuric acid. Just put just put H plus concentration, one mole per m cube. Yeah, but suppose I'm telling the name of the acid, but the name of the acid, where I get the agent ion from. And get a oh well, it's a diprotic or a triprotic. That may say yes, still I got just put H plus concentration, one mole. You don't need to say sulfuric acid. 0 0.5 moles per dm cube. As this ago donate the hydrogen ions, right? You just put hydrogen ion concentration, one mole per dm cube. Even if then get the acid, remember the acid that go break up into hydrogen ion and sulfate. You just put hydrogen ion because for this system, we're interested in H2 and HI and H plus. All right, so we'll still just put the H plus and its concentration. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah, man. Because if you look at them, even when it, even if they tell you iron sulfate, you are using Fe two plus. We are not interested in this sulfate. All right. So just the specific ions we are interested in. So. Yeah. Since. Yeah, there are one standard hydrogen electrode. Why would you mm -hmm. need a salt bridge? At least a half a salt bridge will just have. Based upon, let me check it, textbook, them include it. Let me just put it as well. The part of it. All right. Yeah. So, Jay Dan, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Um, sir, the half cell with a, with a greater E naught value, sir. That will be the anode. Well, it depends. Oh, say, like, how it depends here. Well, we take this to be zero, but some of them, yeah. well, when you are measuring it, remember, not all of them will be above hydrogen. Okay, sir. But, so, I mean, like, so if you are going to measure it, we put anything we are measuring, we make it the we, we make it the, the anode. Was what they're asking? 
Yes, sir. Alright, so in that case, yeah. So we would, you would put it as in. So if we're doing zinc, I'm going to put something here. Let me do this quickly. So first, no, no, no to dry a half cell. Second thing now, we're going to measure the cell potential of something. So let's say we're doing zinc, all right? Let me just clear this. Get an update. Okay. All right. Let's on. Let's. Let me just raise this for a second. Right. So the next container. Mm -hmm. Do it good. When we're doing this, everything is at standard condition. But even the zinc would be one mole per m cube. Uh, you would have this solid. This is a negative. Anyway, in this one, part from different from CXC, the more reactive metal is your anode with the negative electrode. So if you're coming from CXE, just switch that funnel because in CXE, the more reactive one, we would still have used it as the positive. So zinc is negative, right? So you want to measure the cell potential for a particular element to connect it with the hydrogen electrode, right? That is if you want to measure it. Or a particular element. We always use the hydrogen electrode. So when I see those E naught value, E naught is equal to negative, it's a 1.12. We get it from using the hydrogen electrode. We connect it up. Just remember what they use for hydrogen. Platinum, the one atmosphere, H plus. One mole per dm cube. Just ensure you know how to label it. All right. So, now to do the half cell, this SHE, now to draw that by itself. They ask you how you would measure the cell potential for a particular element. You would have to connect it to the standard hydrogen electrode. So, those are two things they can ask for. All right. Just draw the standard hydrogen electrode or to label it. We will measure it for a particular system, the zinc, iodine, whatever one. All right? You would have your metal. So if it is zinc, you would have the zinc metal in a solution of zinc. And the salt bridge is to connect the two solutions. All right? And of course, you have your volt. volt Either. All right. I need to show something else. If it's not, if it's not a metal, as in, for some of them, right? So like for iodine, which you wouldn't have a piece of iodine metal to use, right? So if it's a case, okay, so FE. I'm going to do that one in the past paper. 
Fe2 plus Fe3 plus. Let us say I2, I minus, right? For these, you cannot use in an actual piece of metal where you use zinc and zinc ions. are going to use platinum electrode. So if they give you this Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus, and not like Zn and Zn2 plus, right? If it is two ions, this right here, I'm going to switch it to platinum. Right. So I'm going to add, I'm going to adjust this. So this will become platinum if you are doing one in which it's two ions. So Fe2 plus Fe3 plus, right? So once they give you two things that you don't have the metal to use, use the platinum electrode. Get what I'm saying? I'm not sure. You understand? Somebody? Not really, sir. Right, so if I am going to measure zinc, right? I'm going to put a piece of zinc, right? In a solution, zinc ions. Good. So I have zinc metal, right? In a solution of zinc ions. If they give you, for example, theodine, right? And I minus. You don't have a piece of metal, don't have a piece of iodine metal put in a solution of iodine. So what you would do in that case for your electrode, you are going to use platinum. Is it any clearer? Kind of. Yes, sir. Okay. And in the case of iron, right? When they get as in our money set, you would have your metal atom in contact with the metal ion. You know, if you look at hydrogen, right? Can you get a piece of hydrogen metal? No, oh, hydrogen is a gas. So what you have here is hydrogen gas and hydrogen ions, right? So because this is what you're dealing with, you need an electrode. So you are going to use platinum. You, can, you don't have a piece of hydrogen metal to put in this solution. Hydrogen is a gas. I'm saying when that is the case, you are going to use platinum electrode. So for example, if you are to do an half cell of this, you are to do an half cell for this right here. You are going to have to use the platinum electrode as they gave you two ions, Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. They did not say solid piece of iron in contact with a solution of iron. All right, so I hope you get it. Yes, sir, I do, thank you. All right, so the, the past paper, right? Let me just do it quickly. I'm going to clear the screen. All right, so question when it asks for a definition, I'm going to skip it. All right, I'm going to do part two. So we're doing 2018. Again, it's number five. It had asked you to define standard electrode potential. All right, but I'm going to start at part two. All right, so draw a label diagram. All 
the labeled diagram illustrate how the standard hydrogen electrode No, sir. Show picture of the standard electrode potential So again, once they ask you about measuring it, you have to use the standard hydrogen electrode. So quickly, remember now, once you see two ions, you are going to use platinum as the electrode. Okay. This is platinum. You would need a, a salt bridge. Let me get a little higher. All right. You would have your solution of Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. Right. Both of them are. One moles per BM cube. This is your platinum electrode. You would need a salt bridge. Remember, hydrogen gas would be entering. What else are we missing? Oh, pressure. So you would mention that pressure is one atmosphere. Temperature is 298 Kelvin. Remember also, you will get the data booklet. You will see that iron is positive. Let me see it was how much. Iron, let me check. Iron, did they give iron? No. I'll have to check back the data booklet. Um, all right. So let's check if everything is labeled. Is everything labeled? We can fix it. Anything is missing? It's hard bridge. All right. All right. Sir. Yeah. I saw the label the exam. We're not going to label lines them for one place, them say, in science. Anna bio, as in Anna lab. Anna grade them for Anna now. So, no matter with these type of things, but chemistry. Uh, yeah, man. P R I D G E. So look at the question. Team right here, we measure a label diagram to illustrate. You are measuring standard electrode potential. 
use a she shell, she cell, right? Let me check what the, what now the electrode potential for yarn. Just check it. I think it's more, I think it's positive. If it's positive, it means it is less than hydrogen. So just check it and you would know where to the movement of electrons. All right. But I have to move on. So once they ask you to measure the cell potential, just connect it up to the standard hydrogen electrode. Okay. All right, the next question. All right, take a picture of this. Yes, sir, uh, we're not going to draw the look of tube thing if over on the side. There's two. Never mind. Never mind. No, because I know, uh, yeah, because they, I know, yeah. I just say hydrogen gas. So um, when I read something, I say like the negative one, mm -hmm. the one the most negative um in that value. Yeah, I mean, the one that is oxidized. Yeah, yeah I'm going to explain that to you. I'm going to go to do that part. Just take a picture of this for me. Because there is one. Just take a picture of this. Let's work this quick. I will have a next one I want to work. All right, but I'm gonna get really tired now. So just let's move a little quicker. All right. Right, that is why I'm asking. If you see it for, I let me just check it quickly. I think it's positive, but let me check. Probably not. All right, give me a second. Yes, iron is positive 0 0.77. So it's less than hydrogen. So where do we have the iron? Over here would be the positive. This part would be negative. So when it's positive, it means that it's less than hydrogen. When it's negative. Hey, what would it be greater, sir? As in its potential to see. really so. Oh. To, the, to release the electrons, yeah, it is greater than hydrogen. So let me say that again. Wait, yeah, so if it's positive, if it's negative, if it is, it is going to give up electrons better than hydrogen. Right? So when they measure it, if you get a positive value, it is better at accepting electrons than giving up it. So when it's negative, it has a higher cell potential. So positive is not good in this case. So if it is more positive than hydrogen, should it flow from? Yes, that is correct. In this case, it is the cathode, right? But remember now we know. No, you're doing things for In this, we don't use the cathode as positive here, neg as negative like CSEC. It is more positive, it is the oxidizing agent. Da, 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 da. All right. Hope we're on the same page. All right, so everybody understand what just happened? So the P naught for iron is positive. So, so mm -hmm. that word positive, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure. Can we see something more? Is that difference in C? So. Right. 
Let me use a next diagram. Hold on. Have a next pass paper. It will clear up some oh. stuff as well. Okay, go ahead. Let me just say, like, by convention, like, the one that the more negative, most step on the left hand side, the one more positive, most step on the right hand side. The one with more? Negative. Mm -hmm. In value, more negative. Is on the left hand side? Yeah, it should be on the left hand side. So the hydrogen, in this case, it would flip with hydrogen over here okay. on, the, on the left hand side. Right. Yeah. I wasn't sure of the iron when I started drawing it. We check and it is positive. All right. All right, let's move on. So it says, consider this cell represented below. All right, let me clear this. All right, hold on. What's up? If yeah. since hydrogen is more negative than um iron, wouldn't the electrons flow from hydrogen to iron? That is, that is correct. So uh, that is what I'm saying. When it the more positive it is, the better it is at gaining electrons. That is what the cell potentially is telling you. you know, when it is positive, it is better at gaining electrons than up the electron. Oh, easy to become re oh no problem. So you know some of new mom that thing there. I am ready to this I wanna write it down. And this just right. hold on I'm just work this and then tell me here don't forget to you know just re remind me let me just this and that tell me. Right. So consider the cell represented below. Consider this cell represented below. All right, copper, solid, single line. CO2 plus. By the way, when you get it like this, you should be able to transform this into the actual cell diagram. All right, and then silver ions aqueous dash AG solid. All right, they did not ask you to draw the cell diagram for this, but I'm going to do so quickly. All right. You get this, and they are asked to draw the diagram for it. Well, let's draw our beaker. All right. This, the copper solid, that is your electrode. All right. This line, separate, this is the electrode, that is your electrolyte. All right. Copper ions. Good. This double line is this salt bridge. And it is in contact with the with a solution of silver ion. All right. The silver ion is in contact with silver metal. All right. And then no, you, you would have the let me use the next line, next ink. This is the voltage. This. Uh, I did it. Would switch tarot now. But based on all this set, you start with this over here. Copper, it has a higher, it has a higher, it is more reactive than silver. So the copper is negative, silver is positive. So the, the movement of electron. It's from copper to silver. So, so, so the higher value you look on in terms of the sign, 
to know which is negative and positive. Yes, yes. So that's all right. So let's say this let's say I have one that is positive 0 0.9 and one that is positive 0 0.5. This one is more negative, if you want to say that. Less positive, it, it's closer to being, to being negative. So this would be your negative electrode. Right? And this would be the positive electrode. Because remember, no, what this is showing is the movement of electrons. So whichever one gives up electron easier. So just for a quick second, think of electron like osmosis, right? Where things move from high to low. So the more reactive metal would give off more electrons, correct? Yes. So if, yeah, so if copper is more reactive than silver, the movement of electron will be from copper to silver, right? So the more positive the number, the less likely it is to give up electrons, right? So as it gets close to zero and being negative, it's better at giving up electrons. They will also provide you with the number for copper and silver, all right? All right, so that was so, that. Yeah. Suppose like the 2014, you close. And then you want to send notation like this, except then you want to have a comma in there. We done 2018 and, and then we look at that. So I could just move quick. I really get like it. Let me tell you So I could just put your hand on this. All right, so this was the question. So they gave us this equation. And they said, write the equation for the reaction between copper and silver. So the actual question was for us to write the... Write the equation. the equation for the reaction. Between copper and AG plus, all right? They want the reaction between copper and AG plus. Copper will be oxidized. Right? So copper ions. It will give up two electrons. Silver ions will gain the electron to form silver, solid silver, right? So if this is, you know, two electrons, it would need two silver ions to collect it. So the net equation is copper plus silver, give you Cu2 plus plus, where am I? Cu2 plus plus Ag plus, give copper 2 plus, I'm alive. Ag solid. All right, so it would give a Cu2 plus plus Ag. All right, people. I was awake early morning and I help notes. <laughs> really tired. I said, I thought what time to say. 
Out time, man. 10.30. About 5 o'clock. I really need to get some sleep. Because my head is full and Right, so, yeah. I'm going to wake early and we continue this. So, hold on. One question for yeah, you. Man. Sir, would it be CU plus 2AG plus... Yeah, that may have a plus 2AG. Say it again. It would wouldn't be? be CU plus mm-hmm. 2AG plus... Equals equal yeah. CU2 plus, plus 2 AG. Yeah, man. We have the half fraction of this one. <laughs> yeah, man. Get money. Get money to race. <laughs> yeah, man. I didn't say I'm tired. <laughs> so, we're going to wake earlier, man, and we can't in again. All right? Okay, so, tomorrow, which topic to go into this one? Uh, this the mega record pass pick up on this and rates. And if we can touch the like cool module one, all right. But I'm gonna do the pass pick up on this and rates first. All right. So you will go live tomorrow morning class on YouTube. The same link here. Right. Yeah. Sir, so my boss will be having exam tomorrow morning. Oh. All right, Osh, all the best, Dua. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah man. Bye. Hope it helps, you know. All right. Guys, if I dirt, I dirt, you know. If I dirt, I dirt. If I want to dirt, I do. Just module chain two. I think I have the best than that. Module one, it really broad, as in the topics, them. So just over, over transition, transition and the halogens. Morning, we wake early and we do the rates and, and this. Sir, uh, which sir, which topic you feel them would uh, give you most questions on? That we're not sure because even yes, this case, this is an even with this. Let me see. Oh, welcome from module two again. This rates oil um, rates acid base equilibrium on reader. enough and uh, I see this. And don't forget an energetic enough. and equilibrium. Them see them up with that. Energetic is very broad. This probably may not think much ago come from this. Probably a little calculation, calculate in out of the cell. Probably just um, the rates, rates probably carry 10, 10 to 11 marks. H, probably the same thing. And this one are probably 8 marks. Then for module three, condition and something the condition and the group seven, this bit equally. The no, quality, no, 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 put identification of cations and anions, you know. That that no that no normally carry enough marks, probably one five or six marks. Yeah. I wake early and we say how much we can do. Uh, yeah. All right, so hold on, let me see. Hold on there. We need to five. Hold on. I'm going to go to school first and do it at school. All right, so I'm not going to do it seven. I'm not going to do it five. I'm going to start seven. All right, oh, so yes. yeah, I'm going to do it from school because I'm still have to stop and get ready. So I'm going to start at seven. All right. Um, sir, the next thing for energy. Um, one of them, when the normal that asks for that, like S is law right. and um, honestly, energetics too bad. Honestly, like I have bunny bicycle alone, could I take up a 10 marks? So you have the experiments. You say, so the uh, they really want to kill you up as a big broad topic. Yeah. Energetics, no, module bunny really, it's just too broad. And that's why I said, do module one three first. As energetics is big, atomic structure, forces of attraction, them there, if then enough objectives under them there. No, mommy, no, so no shake me. I say, let's do module two and three first, a four question that one can answer. And then for module three, for module one, uh, Force of attraction, nobody knows. Boy, I say if I dirt, I dirt, yeah, man. 
there's no, no module to entry. A four question that the countries can give or not to, and then try something with module one. So I'm on the now again, all right? So it's seven o'clock, start again, okay? So we have section B as well. I just three question, you know, it changed now. Just three question, 30 marks each, yeah. So I say I'm gonna finish up this paper, what we that do um, tomorrow? The topic for yeah, it have a it have a rate question and the and this question, I mean this topic with redux equilibrium. We have a next one more work to. I'm gonna do two rates and two redux equilibrium. See if we can touch some module one. All right. So about seven to ten in the morning. So the next three hours. And so, two nine morning again, all right? I go end it now.